Our text today, Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, follow me, Jesus calls his disciples. I'm not here to defend it, and I'm not even here to promote it, but for my personal journey, I have fallen in love with the chosen. And one of the scenes that I've watched several times, I'm going to show you, and this is the scene of Luke chapter 5, verses 1. Put that down before I finish. To 11. Let the Father out. I don't have a quote with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Look on Jesus' face. Come, follow me. 
take the fish to the market and stop. I'll get some help to fill both of these boats. Are you sure? Yes, go. What will you tell Ima? <laughs> you just get called by the man we prayed for our entire lives. And you ask me, what will I say when you miss supper? <laughs> go, no. Hey, it's Dallas and the creator of The Chosen. It's funny looking out at you. Some of you are deeply committed to Chosen. It's almost like a cult. You were smiling from ear to ear, and others thought it was good. But how many of you do enjoy The Chosen? Yeah, it's, for me, it, it's been wonderful. So let's look at our text. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. Question, this body of water is also known by two other names. Can you identify them? Lake Gennesaret is known as two, in two, other, two other names. What are they? Sea of Galilee. Yeah, good. Sea of Tiberias. And the reason it has multiple names, it depends how you choose to look at the body of water. Gennesaret has these, this uh, fertile plain northwest of the water. And if you're standing there and you look down, you believe that that body of water is connected to that fertile plain, so you call it that. Sea of Galilee is probably more, Sea of Tiberias is another. Notice with me what the text says. The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. Once Jesus moves from the wilderness into his public ministry, within a very short framework of time, his popularity begins to explode. Uh, let's look at a few verses. Look at, let's go to Luke chapter 8, verse 42. Luke chapter 8, verse 42. Amy, can you read that for us? Luke chapter 8, verse 42. Well, he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. Okay, and right. he went to crowds pressing against him. Yeah, NIV says the crowds almost crushed him. Let's look at verse 45 since we're there. Eight chapter, Luke chapter 8, verse 45. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. There are hundreds of people pushing on you, and you want to know who touched you? When I went to China the very first time, I went by myself and made arrangements that I wanted to go to uh, a couple of the sites to see. Summer Palace would have been one of them that I went to and the Forbidden City, and the Great Wall. The Forbidden City has um, an enclosed large area with walls, and as you go in, there are different buildings within that in which uh, people of importance used to live in. And then there are these passageways that are probably almost the length of our church, and maybe as high, but arched down, and probably as wide as. I was traveling uh, to go into one of the archways when all of a sudden I realized I was no longer in control. There were tens of thousands of people pushing behind me. And even though they were smaller than I, and uh, there was nothing I could do to slow the process down. And that was the first time I realized when I how people get trampled at a concert or pushed against a fence and killed. Because my feeling is just push them away and get out of there. The crowds were absolutely controlling my direction. I couldn't have stopped if I wanted to. I couldn't have slowed down if I wanted to. It was just one of these whoosh. That's how Jesus' ministry really begins in a public forum, is that hundreds and thousands of people begin to press and push demanding attention and desperately trying to reach him. John Lennon, one of the Beatles, made a statement uh, once the Beatles had come to America concerning their popularity and what he said in part 
was that he felt the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. Well, needless to say, every Christian family had a time where they burned the album of the Beatles. I wasn't a Christian, so we kept ours. <laughs> what was interesting is that, the truth be told, the popularity of, of the Beatles may have peaked within a couple of years. Jesus still has 2.6 billion followers. So let Mr. Lennon know that, in fact, Jesus is far more popular than always has been. What's interesting is one has to ask the question, why do you think the popularity of Jesus grew so quickly? Give me some reasons. Why are there hundreds and thousands of people following him? Reason number one. Curiosity. Oh, okay. Curiosity. He's the new show in town. Miracles. Miracles. Miracles and healings and deliverances. There's a manifestation of the ministry that is seen through the pages of the Old Testament on occasion where the power of God does something miraculous and it seems to be coupled with this person. Another one. Their spirit resonated with him. Oh, their spirit resonated with him. That's really good. Uh, what they had been looking for. Remember who primed the pump? John the Baptist. John the Baptist primes the pump and says, Messiah is coming. We're getting close. Get ready. There's an anticipation. Dave Simonson in class said something that I never actually heard put that way. But I thought it was amazing the other uh, Wednesday night. Not only is, I'm saying it differently, so they forgive me. Not only did the Lord anoint the lips of Jesus, but he anointed the ears of the listeners. Mm -hmm. So that anointing brings them together. So let's give four good reasons. Number one, his teaching was different than the religious leaders. His teaching was different than that of religious leaders. Listen, the Jews had no problems finding teachers. The problem with it is all of their teachers were almost identical in their style. They brought nothing new. You heard it one time, you heard it a hundred times. They had a tendency to quote speakers of yesterday as if they were people who had authority. Jesus' teaching is drastically different. He, he says things that they've never heard before. He speaks with an authority they've never heard before. Second reason, his ministry was confirmed with signs and wonders. Acts chapter 2, 22, listen, men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited and pointed out and attested to you by God with the power to perform miracles and wonders and signs which God worked through him and you. So God worked miracles, healings, and signs through Jesus. And that stirred the hearts of the crowds. Third, the Spirit anointed his speech and the Spirit anointed the ears of his listeners. That's a quote from Dave Simonson. Just put Dave S. Another reason it spread so fast is six months John the Baptist spent is that the word, right word for Pete? I'm so proud. Of Bev must have helped me. Uh, John the Baptist piqued the interest and speculation about the coming Messiah. And the Spirit of God is stirring the pot. Now let's, let's go back to our original text, 5.1. According to Luke 5.1, what were the people listening to? The what? Word of God. The Word of God. This is an expression that Luke absolutely loves. Luke 8, 11, 21, 11, 28, Acts 4, 31, 6, 2, 7. He uses approximately 14 times within Luke and in Acts this phrase, the Word of God. There's a magazine, it's called Christianity Today, and J. Ortez entitled an article, it was very interesting, Five Dangerous Trends in Preaching Today. Five dangerous trends in preaching today. I won't give you all five, but here's a couple. He says there is a preaching identity crisis of historical proportion in the evangelic world among millennial pastors. What, what is a millennial? What's the age group? Young. <laughs> so, so grandma. Or 1980 and on, I think. What is it? 1980 and 
All right, so looks like everybody in here is safe. In this article, Ortez says, these pastors are often seen as hipster pastors. And in Sons of God, we have a young pastor who is desperately trying to make a name for himself. And he goes out of his way with his wardrobe. He wears what's called tight jeans. Is it skinny jeans? I call them tight jeans. And I told him, I said, I was wearing those in the 70s because of my weight problem, but it had nothing to do with that. I, I don't know how I feel about the term hipster pastor. I don't even know how to define it, but I do feel I can identify it when I see it. Third thing he said is often, in our crisis, Ortez says, often people pleasers, pastors are people pleasers more than God pleasers. Again, uh, yeah, go ahead. I met a pastor yesterday from the Cornerstone Baptist Church on Miller Road, and he's 26. And I looked at him and I thought, how can you be a pastor of this huge church and only be 26? That's what I thought in my mind. Because I was asking him about their, their, they do the Bible, or King James only. He said, well, that's kind of the tradition here, but it's not the only one I use. That's what he said. He's shifting a little bit. Well, for the record, Jesus was not considered a hipster rabbi. He was far more concerned of what God thought about him than what people thought about him. But I will tell you, there is an undercurrent within the church today to please people. <clears throat> you see, years ago, uh, when Gary and I were younger and engaged in the ministry, there was a loyalty geographically to a church. Now, your parents went there, maybe your grandparents, and you went there. And if for some reason you didn't click with the pastor, that was almost insignificant. That was your church, and that's where you go to church. And there was an overwhelming sense of loyalty to the church, not necessarily to the leadership, but to the church. So the pastor didn't find it a need to please people. Today, it's not uncommon for people to be willing to pack up their kids and their Bibles go 3.2 miles down the road to Church A because Church A will accommodate one of their needs and so pastors know if I don't meet the needs of, and expectations that everybody has I'm in danger of losing people and just so you know though Pastor Tim would never face that uh, I did and others do it's a real challenge what Jesus felt is that if he in fact was loyal to God and faithful to God, God would be responsible to surround him with the people that need to hear his message. And that Jesus was smart enough never to evaluate his success with numbers. In fact, on one occasion when he said something that disturbed the crowd, they began to leave him, thinking that uh, most pastors would panic. Jesus looked at the twelve and said, are you going to go too? He was willing to lose his circle to remain faithful to God. Uh, just so you know, that's pretty unique and pretty special within the heart of the shepherd. Yeah, Kathy? So don't you think that still should be the same today? Don't you think the church would be healthier if pastors still had that mindset? I think pastors should always be more concerned what God thinks about their ministry than what people do. But there, there were points of time, in all honesty, that I think pastors became very insensitive to the needs of parishioners at times. Because they raised both arms and just said, this is what the Lord wants and this is... So I think there's a wonderful balance. I don't think I should change what I'm doing and who I am just to accommodate somebody who has a need. But I think in my quest to pursuing the things of God, I need to be sensitive to recognize that my sheep have needs. But I know what you're saying. I mean, they should always have fruit of the Spirit. Right? Right. Always. You, That's you would hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean. yeah. And what they should have and what they have are sometimes two different things. Jesus doesn't struggle with numbers. 
He's not in a competition. And the reality of it is, he doesn't feed off of the high, and he doesn't get depressed in the lows. The one constant thing about Jesus is that his success is measured by his obedience to God, not by the results of his obedience. Paul used this phrase, some waters, or some sows, some water, but what? God gives the increase. So the best role that I can find is that I'm either sowing or I'm watering. But I can't fool myself and believe that the increase has come because of my performance. Because it comes by God. Any questions or comments? Yeah, Gary? When I, when I read this, this first uh, verse, and it says they were listening to the Word of God. And what I get from that is the miracles, the power of God, came from the sharing of the Word of God. I was listening to Dr. Michael Heiser a couple of days ago. He said, if you want to be involved in spiritual warfare, share the gospel. Because once you begin to share the gospel, all hell will literally break loose. You know, The powers of darkness will come against that because you shine up on your, you're like a torch lit out in darkness. But I think the church has lost that. I think we've become more inward than outward. Mm -hmm. I remember being at one church where when you left the church, they had a sign that said you're now entering the mission field. And I think we've, in some sense, forgotten a lot of that. That our main objective and goal, even like Christ, he went out into the world and he shared the word of God and the miracles and all the other things followed along with that. That's really good. I think if you follow that principle, in the book of Acts, it's quite interesting that with the exception of the day of Pentecost, I don't know of another miracle that's manifested within the confines of the community of believers. <clears throat> the manifestation of miracles, healings, and deliverance takes place when they move outside. I think for most North American Pentecostal charismatics, there is the belief that on Sunday morning, we would love God to put the show on for us every Sunday. And that somehow it affirms our faith in Him. It, it, it causes us to, to, to rise in these occasions of trust when we see God heal the sick. I still believe the greatest place for God to do His greatest works are not in the church, but outside the church. And I'm sure I told you this story, so forgive me, but believe it in Gary. When I was youth pastor in Muskegon, uh, I'm going to use the term, and I understand what it means, a sovereign move of God took place. We had hundreds of people, adults and youth, saved. We had what may have been the worst, I was a youth pastor, the worst senior pastor I've ever worked for. He did not like to preach. He had some emotional problems and challenges. But honestly, when he shut up and gave an altar call, people got saved. One of the people that got saved was a man that cleaned carpets. His name was Vern. And Vern called me and said, what are you doing next Tuesday? I said, I don't think I have a whole lot thinking free meal is a free meal. He said, can you go to work with me? I said, doing what? He said, I just drive on clean carpet, but we can talk. I got so many questions about Jesus and the Holy Ghost and the power of God. Can you do that? And I said immediately, yeah, because I knew somewhere in there there'd be lunch and brunch and probably early dinner. <laughs> I went to the second home and I was helping him get these long tubes out and went inside and the man that owned the home, whose daughter had called to have the carpet clean, was a veteran who was in a wheelchair that had the worst language I've ever heard in my life. I, I've been around, I think it's safe to say, I've heard it all, but not like this. Every word was in top three big boys just coming out of his mouth. So my feeling is what? Clean the carpet, let's move on. Not my friend. My friend goes, are you having a bad day? I'm a cripple. And then he went into this 10 phrase sentence that only had uh, two words other than some curse words. 
What is my thought? Where do I turn on the suction thing? Let's get this thing. <laughs> so Vern says, you know, I'm a Christian. Don't give me that. And then we went off the Christian. Don't tell me about your God. So Vern, he's a new Christian. Here's what he says. I'm going to pray for you. And if you're not healed, I'll admit there's no God. But if you're healed, you'll have to admit there's a God and that he loves you. Now, what am I thinking now? <laughs> so, as he goes through the process of praying, because you guys, go ahead, you know, I wish you go, go, go. <laughs> so, what I'm thinking while Vern's praying, because Vern prays, I'm thinking when I get in the van, this is why I'll tell him that God didn't heal him. You can't put God in a box and you can't. So, as I'm going through this, of course, I have my eyes open and I'm playing like I'm worshiping, but I'm really saying, God, please help me to deal with Vern. He won't understand why you don't heal. And all of a sudden, the man in the wheelchair began to cry. Now, when he cries, my attention shifts to him. And the next thing I know, he takes his hand and he pushes up on his sides. And he stands up and raises both hands. Awesome. Gloriously saved, by the way. Miraculously converted. Miraculously healed. In fact, that person ended up coming to our church. And seven years later, was a board member for one year before he died. Wow. Now, when we got back in the van, what do you think I'd tell Vern? That's how we do it. <laughs> I had been raised in an environment that you didn't often take God outside of the church because you felt you could damage his reputation. You kept him inside of the playpen with Christians because they could tolerate whatever decision God made, yes or no. Now, I don't think it's appropriate to go to everybody and make that deal. I don't think that's how God chooses. But I will tell you this. God is far more interested in manifesting his power to unbelievers than to affirm faith of believers. It doesn't mean you're not in a position to get healed or delivered. Of course not. But I'm just telling you, from a New Testament perspective, Jesus is used by God to manifest his presence with the preaching of the word to people who were not believers, far more than when he met privately with the 12 or the 70. So I think that's a point. So it is interesting to note that although they're intrigued by the miracles, what captures their long-term interest is connected to the word of God. Let's go to verse 2. We saw the water's edge, two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Um, the problem Jesus is having at this body of water is that the crowds have come and there's no place for him to escape. They have encircled him and they're pushing him towards the, the shoreline itself. They, they will follow him into the water to touch him or to be close to him. He realizes that with people so close to him, his voice will not carry properly for those who are extended 20 rows behind so he looks and he discovers there's two boats on shore. The reason they're on shore is they have fished all night. Now remember, fishing takes place in the Sea of Galilee, as in most places, even in Asia, it takes place at night when the water is cooler. The fish move from deep water to cooler water. And what happens, it's more accessible with the nets to fish at night than it is during the day. No fisherman in their right mind in this first century would have used dragging nets in, in the day. They only use them at night. So during the day when they pull up their boats, they take their nets out, they mend them, and they clean them. Jesus noticed these two boats were unoccupied. He gets in the first boat, and this is great. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught people from the boat. A couple things I want you to notice here is the. <clears throat> that he makes a request to Simon. What is the request from Simon? To move the boat. To move the boat. A short distance. If you're taking notes, write this in your little column. Because this is what I wrote down. This is Peter's first expression of obedience. It seems insignificant, doesn't it? He probably pushed Jesus out of the water, I don't know. 15 feet, 20 feet, 25 feet. It's pretty simple. This is his first step. 
Have you ever noticed that people, we often struggle saying yes to God in areas that we feel we're capable of handing without His instruction? Yeah, oh God, you want me to do this? I don't really understand that. I'll do it. Whatever you want me to do, I'm here available. But when God talks to me about an area that I feel I know what needs to be done better than what He needs to be done, I usually don't do it. Simon's facing one of those challenges right now. So Simon answers, Master, we've worked hard all night, haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down my nuts. If Simon doesn't obey the first command, I would suggest to you there is no second command. If he doesn't show himself faithful in the little things, there will not be the bigger thing to follow. Jesus is called Master here for the first time in the Gospel of Luke. It's interesting to note that Mark and Matthew refer to Jesus as teacher and rabbi only. Luke is the only one that uses Master. And he uses it in 824, 45, 933, 49, 17, and 13. This must have been humbling to Simon Peter because remember there's an audience there, a large audience. And this fisherman who's tried to create a reputation for himself has just discovered that a carpenter is giving him instructions on when, where, and how to fish. But he chooses to humble himself. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, James and John, the sons of thunder. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. There were two things that occurred through this miracle that Jesus performs. The first one, if you're taking notes. Simon becomes aware of Jesus in a new way. He fell at his knees. He uses the word Lord. And the second thing I want you to know, Simon became aware that he was a sinful man. Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. Remember Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1? I saw the Lord seated on the throne high and exalted. And then the next verse, verse 5, he says, Woe to me. There's this expression that when I see the glory of who God is and what he can do, and then I look at my own life, there is such separation from where he is and where I am that it magnifies his lordship, but it also magnifies my sinfulness. We talked about some of the things that I would like to see the church, not New Life Christian Fellow, but the global church experience before the coming of the Lord. I would like to see a real baptism of becoming, having a reverence and a fear of the Lord from a, new, from a, a biblical perspective that I think is long overdue. So that we don't fear Him in the sense that we're afraid, but we fear Him in the sense that our respect for Him is so great that it magnifies who He is but it also reflects who we really are and usually calls for repentance. Job chapter 42, Job has this experience, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. When I see you here, I see myself here. When, I, when Peter saw the glory of who Jesus was because of what he had just proclaimed, he sees himself here. I think it would be a really good experience for the global church to get that in perspective. Who God is and who we are. What's interesting is what follows. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid from now on, you will fish for people. The rules of fishing for fish and the rules of fishing for people are almost reversed. In fish, they tell me, I haven't had a look at this, but you catch live fish and then they die. In searching for men, you catch dead fish and God brings them to life. So there's this reversal of experience. 
So verse 11, they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. Everything changes from this point on for the disciples. They have abandoned their responsibilities and they have decided to commit their ways unto the Lord and follow him. The next 16 months, they will be transformed. They will be turned inside, outside, outside, inside, and they will have a journey that will change them forever. Any questions about our miracle or any comments? Yeah. This occurs before Peter acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah. And I'm just wondering, what's the precedent for him to use the word Lord and be trusted? Well, why does he use the word Lord? Yeah. I don't think it's necessarily acknowledging that he's looking at the incarnated God. It is one of the words used in the deepest respect of a spiritual leader in the sense that this is somebody that... That's probably why Matthew and uh, Mark prefer to use the word rabbi or, or, or teacher at this stage of the game. So it is surprising that Luke would record that, but whatever it is, it is of such respect that he's willing to abandon his job that's been providing for him and his family. And what's interesting is, Terry, is that there is no indication of what type of commitment Jesus is calling them to. Come follow me for the day. Did they really know that their, the commitment was going to be for life? Did they ever go back and fish while they were in relationship with Jesus? If Jesus is struggling to pay taxes because he doesn't have money in his purse, how did the families of these men survive in the absence of their husbands? But that's a good question. Whatever it is, he recognizes that Jesus is different than any other teacher, and he's willing to follow. Pastor Tim? I'm just going to shade that a little bit by saying, too, that we think, because of trying to translate things, you know, when the Lord is used in the Old Testament, they use it for the, the very direct name of God, so we think of God, but I think Lord New Testament is that Kyrios or whatever, Lord, Kyrios. Master, Teacher, Leader, you know. Yeah, it's just under that umbrella of somebody that you're extending the highest respect to. Yeah. And, and so it could have been used in a different context. He is not believing that Jesus is the incarnated God. Of the Old Testament. What do you think they knew about him? They had heard all the rumors? Well, there's not a whole lot of rumors to this point. There's some. It, it, what's tough is when you look at the synoptic gospels trying to get a chronological uh, chart, it appears at this from this point Jesus has already been at the household of Simon Peter after the first synagogue service he had in Capernaum and healed his mother-in-law. So they've already seen activity that would indicate that Jesus can do things no other teacher can do. It may be one of the reasons he's willing to push his boat out. You know, he healed my mother-in-law. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Uh, but I, I respect him. But they have no idea what's waiting for them. They are all, including the men working on their nets, they are all intrigued by his teaching of the Word of God. Were there other spirits that could heal people? Would that be just a different person that was healing people at that time? Yeah, I'm, you know, obviously I don't have information to say with 100%. There's no indication within secondary sources that Israel is experiencing anyone else who can bring healing. Now, between Malachi and the New Testament, there are a number of people who claim to be Messiah, but they don't have any power to back it up. And they usually are more of a zealot, trying to say that it's time to rise up, it's God has sent me to deliver you from the yoke of Rome, but there's no indication that they have any miraculous power. So there were others who claimed to be Messiah, but no one else had the power to back it up except Jesus. Another question or comment?
So let me close and ask you a question. Which is it easier, which would you think is easier to do? For Simon to leave his fishing business and follow Jesus, or for you to follow Jesus? Which do you think is easier? Neither is the same. What's that? Neither. Neither is easy? Okay. It should be the same. I mean, you have to leave everything behind to follow him. Okay. We know for sure Simon did not put his business up for sale. How do we know for sure? Because he's fishing again afterwards. Because after the death of Jesus, guess where he went? Yeah, back to Galilee. Back to the boats. That's what I know to do. It'll be fine. It was quite a ride. 16 months, can you believe it? Well, the story is I'll have to tell my grandkids. Back to fishing they went. I, I think the answer, Kathy, and Shirley will probably touched on, is that if in fact by following him we mean we surrender every aspect of our life to him, then it's exactly the same. I think sometimes we have a tendency to give God parts of our life, but we also like to retain part of it for our own sense of security. That doesn't mean when you follow Jesus you have to go in and tell your boss, I quit. But it does mean that he has the reins of your life for your past, your present, and your future. And that your prayer every day is that his will will be done in this tabernacle as it's done in heaven. Surrender should not be a decision made at one moment of time. Surrender should be reinforced again and again and again and again in our life. Today when you go into the service, you're going to be seeing, uh, there will be little cards on your seats. It talks about Daniel and Gunn, who are missionaries in Thailand, and they have a chance to buy this van. It's a used van, but it's very nice, uh, very expensive in Thailand to have vans and things. It would help them with their family, but in their ministry. And it was interesting because they have, uh, Pastor Tim has a request that we want to participate. And I didn't ask myself, what do I feel I should give? I didn't even ask that. I asked myself, what would you want me to do? Because my money is really his money. I'm just a steward. Mm -hmm. So God, tell me what you want me to do. Notice who I didn't ask in that. Beth. <laughs> but she will agree with me. So then your daughter was in front of me. And I thought, okay, I feel like the Spirit of God at least has impressed the number of my mind. And so I asked her for a pin. Because I was concerned that if I didn't fill it out quickly, I would somehow justify why I couldn't. So I ended up borrowing a pen from the lady next to me and I wrote it out, dropped it in, so it's done. That's surrender. That I don't have the luxury to make decisions based on what I think when it comes to the kingdom's purposes, but I have to say, God, what do you want me to do? And it certainly is the process in which I declare him and live out my life as though he is the Lord or my master and I'm the doers. Okay, don't forget Chosen comes out, the new season comes out in November. They're going to do a release of chapter, or chapter 3, season 3, 1 and 2 is going to be shown at the theaters. So episode 1, episode 2 will be at the theaters. So if you like that, make sure that you come and watch. All right, God bless you. No Sunday school next week because there's a holiday.